morning comes to us from the book of Revelation, chapter 21, verses 10, 22 through 27, chapter 22, verses 1 through 5. The writer of Revelation said this, The angel took me in a spirit-inspired trance to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. I didn't see a temple in the city because its temple is the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. The city doesn't need the sun or moon to shine on it because God's glory is its light and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light and the king of kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Its gates will never be shut by day and there will be no night there. They will bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. Nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is vile and deceitful, but only those who are registered in the Lamb's scroll of life. Then the angel showed me the river of life-giving water, shining like crystal flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb through the middle of the city's main street. On each side of the river is the tree of life, which produces twelve crops of fruit, bearing its fruit each month. The tree's leaves are for the healing of the nations. There will no longer be any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and God's servants will worship God. They will see God's face, and God's name will be on their foreheads. Night will be no more. They won't need the light of the Lamb or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will shine on them, and they will rule forever and always. <coughs> Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I lied. 
lied and told her my parents didn't let me watch movies. <laughs> I have no idea why she believed that, because I definitely watched a lot of MTV growing up. But she believed me. Whatever the case, I had a strong aversion to these movies and these books. I knew what they were about, but I was not about to be kept up with those revelatory nightmares. Now, I had heard from my friends' pastors around town about these books, and they touted the importance of these stories, not as fiction, to be thought about in a metaphorical sense about our lives, but as though they were actual truth. That a select group of people would suddenly disappear, and then the rest of us would end up in this seven-year battle with a literal antichrist who worked in the United Nations, while we all stockpiled guns and ammunitions to fight them off, all while terrible, horrible things would be happening throughout the world around us, and after seven years of this turmoil and strife, Jesus would come back, sword-wielding and ready for literal battle, like a knight in shining armor on a white horse. Now, for all of his naysaying, my Presbyterian pastor, God bless him, he never fully convinced me that these books weren't accurate when it came to the end of times, because everyone else believed them, so I did too. These books were treated as though they were part of the biblical canon, as though these were the things that were actually going to come true. Now, the Left Behind series fed into this already existing fear of impending doom for people when they came out. New York Times writer Lori Goodstein wrote, The Left Behind series is one indication of the public's fixation on the approaching millennium and the widespread anticipation that the year 2000 portends some earth-shattering event. Now, I don't know if you all remember the whole Y2K phenomenon. Anybody remember that one? When these books came out, there was already a lot of fear, already steeped in that Y2K dilemma, and it wasn't just from Christians. Everybody was asking, what's going to happen in this new millennia? Honestly, those writers were geniuses, because not only did they play on the already existing fears that every Christian had about the possible end of times, but they played on the fears that so many people simply had with the upcoming millennia. For so many of them now, for so many then and now, these books speak truth. They are the interpreted events that will happen based on a few very short passages from a couple of books in the Bible, and from one book in particular, everyone's favorite, Revelation. And Revelation is one of those books that even if you've never read through it, you know about it. Revelation holds a special place in popular culture in a way that no other book in our biblical canon quite does. And rightly so, it conjures up some really bizarre images. One of my all-time favorite paintings from my college art days is the triptych from the painter Bosch entitled The Garden of Earthly Delights. On the outside panel is painted the world and the creation story from Genesis, just before God creates humans. And when you open it up, there are three panels depicting some rather bizarre images. In it, humans are acting with complete and unbound free will. The images might be a bit upsetting to some. People seeking various pleasure-inducing things, a pre-born Jesus wrapped in red cloth, blessing Adam and Eve's supposed marriage, and then a panel depicting what Bosch thought hell and the final judgment by God might be. Humans have been assessed over this idea of the end of times for generations, and honestly, we still are. This is why Revelation is so fascinating and also so difficult for so many. Today's passage is after all the battles and the gore and the kind of weird things happening. It's focused on what comes out of all these big events. The holy city, the new Jerusalem that God is going to create for God's people. This, this is the culminating passage of everything that God has been building towards. And here we have the vision of the beautiful holy city where light isn't even needed because God's glory 
will shine so brightly that lamps and the sun are no longer needed to see. The battle has been won and the beautiful end of times has come to culmination with God the light and ruler and Jesus the sweet little lamb. This is John's vision, not the Apostle John, a, a later John who was a believer and a preacher. It's a weird version full of crazy images for sure, but at the end of all things, it's a vision of God entering into the world. And there's no more war. There's no more violence. There's no more shame. There's no more injustice or prejudice or inequality. We'll all be made right and so will the world. When you take out all the other strange and difficult imagery, it's actually quite wonderful to think about. But it's hard to get this, to get past that, the, the harder stuff. It's hard to get to the easier stuff because you have to go through the harder stuff. That's right. <laughs> Sometimes it's hard. Compared to our other canonical books, this one is the hardest to get through. But we can't ignore it because if we're going to be honest about our faith, and about the story that God is writing in the world, then this is part of that story. In fact, we're supposed to be actively working towards this idea of God coming into the world and ushering in a time of peace. It's described as the New Jerusalem, not the actual city of Jerusalem as we know it, but the idea of a peaceful place where all of God's creation is gathered together in love and peace and in right relationship with God. This other John wrote Revelation around the later end of the first century to the churches in the area of the Roman Empire that we now know as Turkey. These people were confronted with a critical religious and political situation. The church was in the midst of a massive transformation. Their apostolic leaders were long gone, and they were attempting to identify who they were while building a firm structure of the church moving forward in the world. And John here was attempting to let them know that even if things seemed bad, they could and probably would get worse, but that eventually it would all be worth it. Like the book of Corinthians and others in our canon, this is one of those letters meant to be read aloud in public worship. This letter was not written to us. It was written for someone else in another time and place and in another language. But that does not diminish the importance it has because it gives us not only an idea of what was happening back in the first century after Jesus had left, but it also lets us know that other churches, other churches and believers struggle just like we still do today. The people this letter was written to had been through a myriad of troubling issues, multiple wars, political upheaval in Rome, Mount Vesuvius had erupted burying Pompeii covering the world around it in dust and ash and darkness, multiple earthquakes and famished, and the earth was left ravaged. As Christians, they were up against the people in power who proclaimed that their Lord was whoever was emperor at the time. Imagine being a Christian back then. You're still in a young faith community trying to establish itself and at the same time, you're trying to figure out what all these cataclysmic events mean when you're claiming God is sovereign and Jesus is the anointed one. These people lived in an insane world, pulling them in all kinds of directions, and John was just trying to help them make sense of it all. This was a letter for people living in a different time and place. But this letter is also a letter for us today. We, too, live in a world of natural disasters, political upheaval, injustice, wars left and right, human rights violations across the globe, and those in power who claim to follow the God of the Trinity only to turn around and serve other gods here on earth. Maybe this is exactly the book we need right now. How do we make sense of this world and all that is in it when we proclaim that God is our sovereign who loves us and created us to be good and also proclaim Jesus as our risen Savior here to redeem us when we live in a broken world that just seems to be broken over and over and over every day? It's like as soon as one earthquake happens, a tornado hits another part of the world. Or as soon as we recover from one terrorist attack, Another school shooting takes place. 
The more and more I think about it, while this letter was not written for us, it just might be what we need right now. Where in the midst of hurt and suffering and pain and injustice, God enters into the world, and we get to live in this holy place, flowing waters where school shootings aren't the norm, where tornadoes and tsunamis are no more, where prejudice and racism and homophobia and sexism have no place, where the hungry are fed, the naked are clothed, where Matthew 25 has been fulfilled. Maybe this is just what we need. But like so many things in our lives, the things we need are also some of the hardest things. Despite being a bit bizarre, Revelation acknowledges the hardship and suffering and injustices that come with daily life. And at the same time, it invokes the deepest longings of our hearts, where we are whole and healed and all is right with creation. Despite what popular fiction tells us, we as Christians know that no one ever gets left behind. Because God doesn't allow for that. Like the story of the lost sheep from Matthew and Luke. One of the lost sheep of a hundred in the flock. God goes and brings it back. No one is left behind. Not even the one sheep that wanders away for whatever reason. It doesn't matter. This vision isn't of the end. It's simply of God entering into the world. It's a vision of God coming and fulfilling God's promise to us. Those things in popular culture, like the Left Behind series, those are not God's promise. They do not reflect the covenant God made in Genesis to never destroy the earth again. They do not reflect the promise of life for all that Jesus came for. They do not reflect the Holy Spirit being present with all of creation that we hear about in Joel and Acts. No one gets left behind in God's story. And here's the thing no one tells you about Revelation either, is that it's not the end. This letter was never intended to be the end. This letter was never intended to even become canon. In fact, it was one of the more hotly contested books in the Bible. Generations fought over whether or not it should even be included. And honestly, I cannot tell you why on earth they did include it. Except that while it has some odd and difficult things to it, it's also filled with hope that it's not about the end of times. It's simply about God becoming more present in God's world in the midst of strife and pain and suffering and injustice. This is not the end of God's story, and this is not the end of our story. As people of faith, our job is to act in the world to be the hands and feet of Christ. Friends, this new holy world is only possible through us. It is possible when we stop condoning school shootings so we can have guns. It's possible when we stop saying it's okay that black and brown bodies are less than white bodies. It is possible when we stop serving the God of money and material things and the God of structural racism and power and we start serving our neighbors. This holy place of God is only possible when we start seeing our neighbors as ourselves, when we offer each other the benefit of the doubt, when we renounce hatred and violence in God's name. It is possible when we actively continue to work to dismantle racism and homophobia and sexism and every other ism that fills our world. It is possible when we stop victim shaming and start holding people accountable for their actions. It is possible through us, not because of us, but because of God. Because God works through us. Jesus gave us commands to live out in his absence and beyond, and the Holy Spirit is here flowing and breathing through us continually. This holy place, this vision John has, it is possible if we really want it to be. It does not mean that things still won't be hard or hurt. But it does mean that no one is left behind, and when there is hurt or pain or suffering, then we address it instead of passing it over because we've run out of time or resources or because it helps to line the pockets of people in power. I don't have a lot of answers for you about some of that weird stuff in Revelation. We can talk about it. But I don't have an answer. That's not today's sermon. But I can say this with complete confidence and authority is that regardless of what popular culture says, there is no end. 
No one gets left behind. God is ushered into the world, and when our actions and hearts and minds line up with what it is that Jesus came to teach us, and when we allow the Holy Spirit to actually do her work through us, then this is the good news, is that it can get better. It can get so much better. And it will, because that's the promise and hope that we have in God. Amen.